But uh, today we are continuing in our I Am series, and specifically today we're focusing in on John 10, where we find Jesus' I Am the Good Shepherd passage. Uh, We're going to be breaking down this passage and analyzing each piece as it applies to us in our relationship with Jesus and with with the Father. Um, Our goal will be to have a better understanding of Jesus and the kingdom through the illustration of our identity as sheep in the Good Shepherd's flock. So let's go back and examine the whole passage in John, I'm sorry, in John 10 to gain some context uh, for our statement in this text. So if you'll find your way to John chapter 10, verses 1, we're going to be looking at 1 through 18. Verse 1, Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep, enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper who opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and the sheep know, my, know me. Just as the father knows me and I, the, I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will, will listen to my voice and they, there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So Jesus describes in this passage what it means to be a shepherd. And really, he's describing how to pastor his people. So let's break down the, let's break apart the passage in pieces. First, one through four. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls the sheep by, by my name and leads them out. When he is brought out, When he has brought all of his own, he goes ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. This introductory piece explains how a shepherd is trusted by his sheep. He brings truth, not lies. He is honest and trustworthy. He doesn't get into the pen by by dishonest means like a thief. He is not deceptive or disingenuous. The sheep listen to him, and they obey his voice, and they trust him. See, the first verse tells us The first and the fifth verse tell us a little more about the message he's trying to send and who he's talking to. He's talking to the Pharisees. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. And then in verse 5, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. These bookended statements here are directed at the Pharisees. And for today's application, anyone who finds themselves behaving like them. By describing what an honest shepherd is and does, he illustrates how they should be responded to and uh, by the people of Israel. See, this is supposed to be a slightly subtle way to tell the Pharisees where they are missing the mark. But, as verse 6 tells us, they've missed the point. So therefore, Jesus said again in verse 7, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. 
The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. We often see Jesus when he's talking in parable or story or in illustration, he's explaining his meaning to make sure the point gets understood. Here he explains that he is the gate for the sheep to go through and find pasture. He is the way by which they will find truth and salvation. He tells them that others, false prophets and teachers, rulers, have come before him and they've tried to lead the people a certain way, but the sheep have not listened to them. I think he's trying to get them to examine themselves for a moment and determine if they have been deceitful, if they have been untrustworthy, feeding lies to his people, if they have behaved like a thief. To drive the point home here, he tells them that a thief comes to steal or kill and destroy. He removes any angle by which they might say, well, my heart was in the right place. See, don't we fall into that trap sometimes when we're evangelizing and we're we're ministering to people? We shoot them right between the eyes with the truth. We we shoot them right between the eyes with judgment. We beat them over the head with with Scripture in order to whip them into righteous submission. People that we are trying to evangelize to or disciple quickly become whipping posts at times for our own standards of Christian elitism. And why do we do this? Why do we do this to people? We say, well, I was just trying to evangelize and introduce them to Jesus. We have good intentions, but possibly a bad approach. The last time I checked, this isn't how Jesus dealt with people he was trying to reach. He gave them truth, and that part is here. We see the Pharisees always trying to bring truth to the situation. But he was also loving and gracious, something that the Pharisees often were not. Christianity gets a bad rap for being super judgy and super hypocritical. Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed tombs, but on the inside they were full of dead man's bones. The Pharisees were legalists and elitists. And a legalist is someone who uses external measurements, performance, or behaviors, or righteous religious activities to gauge how spiritual they or other people may be. And they expect others to think like they do, or believe like they do, or worship like they do. And if they don't, they judge judge people for that. But for the record, I want to be clear, I, Chris Maddox, am a recovering legalist. See, I grew up around a racist grandfather. I was raised in churches that would have considered the music stylings of Severn Christian Church to be liberal by traditional comparison. I was raised to think that alcohol was of, the, was of the devil, cigarettes were a sure way to get you to hell, and sex was a four-letter word in any language. And then don't get me started on, uh, on drug abusers and traffic violators. Oh, good, you picked up on the joke, good. I'm not saying that those things are okay or, shouldn't be, or should be treated as mundane. But in my life, those things quickly became the checklist by which I would separate myself and I would judge other people by and I would decide how close I would get to these people. And see, I've been trying over the past five to ten years to think more like Christ when I encounter someone who thinks differently or behaves differently than I do. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 20 through 22, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I have tried to follow this principle as much as possible, when, uh, that we sometimes have to engage people where they are, when we're trying to show them where Christ's kingdom is. Now, I haven't taken this road quite as far as uh, when I'm in, uh, encountering advocates for cannabis legalization, but who knows? It's 2018. It's not too late. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Let's back to our, back to our passage. See, the Pharisees believed that holiness was a result of purity, and purity was achieved by separating yourself from sinners and unclean things. But this is not the way of God's kingdom. Purity is important because it does lead to holiness. But evangelism 
is meant to be done in the company of sinners. Remember what Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need the doctor, but rather the sick. We can't allow our judgments and our legalism to separate us from those we're supposed to be evangelizing to or discipling. We have to be careful not to fall into the same trap as the Pharisees, that we don't want to behave like thieves or wolves in God's sheep pen. So let's look at the second part of verse 10 here. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus came to lead, heal, and give life. And this sets the stage for the rest of our introduction to Jesus' statement, I am the good shepherd. In verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I don't think I need to explain too much what this means. You all seem like a pretty smart bunch. You've picked up on my joke so far. You all understand that he's talking about how he would later go on to be the sacrificial offering for his people. He would literally lay down his life for his sheep. But for the purpose of this story that he's telling, he is also describing the love that a shepherd has for his sheep. That he is willing to put himself in front of danger for his sheep, even to the point of losing his own life. Verse 12, he counter he contrasts this. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. But when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for his sheep. This is a pretty practical reinforcement of his previous thought. The man who is paid to watch the sheep that are not his will not risk his life to protect dumb animals. He will flee and leave the sheep to fend for themselves. This also helps solidify how important the sheep are to the shepherd. They are more than just livestock. They have value and worth to the shepherd to the point that he is willing to protect them and take care of them. Verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Again, Jesus says it. I am the good shepherd. This repetitive statement. His sheep recognize his voice. This is just as much of a gut check for us as it is a factoid in this passage. If we are followers of Christ, we are part of his flock, then we should know his voice. After all, he told us earlier in verse 4 and 5 that the sheep will will only listen to the shepherd and not a stranger because they recognize the shepherd's voice. So how do we recognize the voice of Jesus and the Father? We have to know scripture, first and foremost. We have to be in tune with the Spirit. We have to be in line with his will. And the only way to recognize his voice is to study his word and listen to the wisdom of his Spirit. Verse 15. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I will lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This verse is a little bit of a slap in the face to first century Judaistic uh, Pharisaical legalism. Remember, Jesus was a Jew. So were the Pharisees. The Jews were God's chosen people. Israel had the covenant. Israel was important. From where the Jews sat, it was Israel and everybody else, the Gentiles. And if you were a Gentile, you weren't worth much to God from the Jews' opinion. But Jesus is saying here that that line of thinking, that that idea is invalid and it's incorrect. He's affirming to everybody present, and specifically the Pharisees, that Gentiles will be welcomed into the sheep pen. In this passage, he is breaking down barriers and walls, and he's trying to make the connection that Jews and Gentiles will be one in God's kingdom. He doesn't seem to make any distinction between them. He is trying to create them as an equal idea. And in verse 17, the reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from the father. The, conclus- the conclusory statements here focus on Jesus' willingness to be that sacrifice, the propitiation for his flock. He says that the Father loves him 
for his decision to submit to his will and that his life is laid down by his own authority. He says that he has the power to take it up, take his life up again. One might think, well, how significant is it that Jesus would lay it down and sacrifice himself knowing that he could just come back? But Jesus was going to take on the weight of all mankind's sin and transgressions. The thing that separates us from God would be his burden that he would have to carry into death. He became sin, and sin divides us from God. And therefore, Jesus, covered in our sin, would have to endure the separation from the Father. God turned his back on Jesus in the moment of death and became, or because he was no longer the spotless lamb. And that separation would have been reason enough for some to say, nope, not worth it, not doing it. But this whole conversation has a different meaning to us on this side of the cross. For his listeners, they probably wouldn't have connected the Isaiah 53 passage in reference to what Jesus was saying as that was going to be happening over the next few weeks and the few months coming to his crucifixion. Jesus knew he would suffer. He knew in great detail exactly what was going to transpire. Knowing what we know today, we have to consider this text and measure how much greater that sacrifice would be to Jesus. Recall for me for a moment what Jesus was heading towards. Let's take a look at the crucifixion account. Yes, he knew he was going to die. He knew his life would be taken at the hands of the Romans, of cruel men who did not love God. Moreover, he knew in what way he would suffer on the way to his death. And the Bible gives us a snapshot in Matthew of what his torture looked like. Matthew 27, verses 26 through 31. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they mocked him, they took off the robe and put on, put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. It's in verse 26 when it says he had Jesus flogged. Well, that's a pretty vague English translation of the event. If you'd look at Roman tradition... His flogging was pretty in-depth. David McAllister, or sorry, McLister, describes it this way. The scourging, what Jesus endured. Scourging called verbatio, yeah, verbatio by the Romans was possibly the worst kind of flogging administered by ancient courts. While the Jews administered whippings in the synagogues for certain offenses, these were mild in comparison to scourging. Scourging was not normally a form of execution, but it certainly was brutal enough to be fatal in many cases. A person certainly could be beaten to death by the scourge if that was desired. Its purpose was not only to cause great pain, but to humiliate as well. To scourge a man was to beat him worse than one would would beat a stupid animal. It was belittling, debasing, and demeaning. It was considered such a a degrading form of punishment that according to the Portion and Sempor and Sempronian laws, Roman citizens were exempt from it. It was, therefore, the punishment appropriate only for slaves and non Romans, those who were viewed as the lesser elements in Roman society. To make it as humiliating as possible, scourging was carried out in public. The article by David goes, uh, goes on to describe the actual performance of the scourging in all of its forms and with all of its tools, and I won't go into the detail of that. But if you've seen the movie The Passion of the Christ, you get a pretty decent glimpse at how excruciating it was. So then we have to think, how great is Jesus' love for his sheep? If he is willing to endure the cross, a painful death in itself, and then the scourging to boot. The passage helps us shape in our mind how amazing the love of God is for his people. He tells us how trustworthy he is as the shepherd, how willing he is to nurture and tend his sheep and their needs, how he is the gate by which they will find salvation and rescue. 
He is the good shepherd who, when the wolves and thieves come, he will stop at nothing to protect his sheep, even to the point of laying down his life and separating himself from the Father. He concludes the conversation and passage here with the Pharisees by saying, I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. Not only does our shepherd love his flock, he has the power to conquer death. He loved us enough to protect us from false teachers and rulers who lead us astray. He brought us truth and grace. He conquered death for us. And it is because of Jesus laying down his life and conquering death that he is the gate by which his sheep can be saved. We must listen to his voice and recognize his call and follow him. See, Jesus wants a relationship with us today. And if you don't know this man called Jesus, who called himself the good shepherd, then we encourage you to ask questions, to read your Bible, The gospel will give you a great introduction. If your question, if you questions, if your questions, (laughs) if you have questions, see, that's why you have typos. If you have questions, our evangelists and our elders are happy to, to meet with you and to talk with you, to answer those questions and help you determine in your mind what the truth is. We want anyone who is seeking God to find him. We desire to remove any distractions or hindrances that might keep us and others from that. And if you're a recovering legalist like I am, then I encourage you to pray that God will show you how to live graciously. If you feel like you know God, but you didn't have a good grasp on hearing his voice, then I encourage you to read your Bible and listen as he speaks to you and speaks to your heart. Make it a daily practice in your life. And if you are here this morning and all of this seems foreign and and unknown, come and ask questions. Continue to come back week after week and come to our classes, come to our Bible studies. It's a great opportunity not only to fellowship and connect with with like-minded folks, but also to get answers and to find out more truth. So this morning, if if that's where you find yourself or you find that you want to make a decision to, to learn more or to to live for Jesus. We invite you to come and our elders and and Rick will come forward and we would love to talk with you. So right now we're going to sing a song of invitation for that, but we also, I'm going to go ahead and pray us out. I want to thank everybody again for allowing me to be here today and to to bring a message to you. But I also just want to thank you so much for allowing me and my family to to minister here and be a part of what's going on at Severn. Hallelujah.